Sit there or there sure. or whatever. No, no, fine. Well, well thanks, Gary. Uh, the first I was wondering was uh, <laughs> whether this, this uh, dinner many of us or some of us had did contain any hidden messages. And uh, we were wondering about patronizing Yankees uh, towards Brits. And uh, the hidden message I got, uh, Gary, from, from the dinner was the, there was uh, one course was fish and chips. And I wasn't sure whether it was a very sophisticated hint and, well, the British is basically down to fish and chips or whatever. It was very good, so I'm not sure whether it was the one. Well, let's start the discussion. Well, thanks for the introduction, Gary. Uh, first, I'm glad you are alive, uh, Markham. Uh, so and, am and, I. And, was, uh, <laughs> and, and it, it's, not, it's not so much because we, we spent a couple of hours last night in some fancy restaurant and had some drinks. But, uh, and I was slightly hesitative to do the moderation because if, if you enter the world of Malcolm McLaren, this guy is a legend, he's, he's a myth. And at one stage you wonder, well, can this person still be alive or is he somewhere up in the Olympus of uh, the living legends of, uh, of popular culture, high culture, which we will introduce in a minute. But he's still there, and so I was very happy to, to, to find you alive, and, and quite a lot so. Uh, and the final thing I, I will mention in my introduction is that if you, you, you go to a, to, a, to a concert of the Rolling Stones, uh, or uh, the Beatles don't exist anymore, or any other famous group like ABBA or who else, one thing you always wonder, isn't this too bad that these guys since decades have to play satisfaction all over again. So it's your satisfaction or this satisfaction, and you won't be surprised that I start with asking you, as anyone did, the guys we met last night, uh, Michael McLaren, isn't this the guy who helped found or even founded the Sex Pistols? Are you? Gary, is that a correct word to use once in this year? Isn't that pissing for you to be asked all the time first about Sex Pistols? Sorry, but the Sex Pistols just demand such a term, and it's uh, censored from there on, I suppose. No FCC around, Gary, right? Is it? OK. So is that, a, is, it, is, it, is that a question to be asked first about the Sex Pistols you hate, or is that part of your, your biography, your story, and you like talking about it? I don't think it's as big an idea as you maintain. OK. I, I really don't. Do I? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> Quite a few I think people it's, do. <laughs> I think it's the easiest way in uh -huh. to any conversation with right. me if you don't okay. know me. <laughs> I try to be sophisticated about it. If a girl well. was trying to pick me up <laughs> okay. and she started talking about that, I'd be really uh -huh. put off, you know? Really? Yeah, yeah, because it's kind of so easy. Uh -huh. And I think, but what about me? Well. <laughs> Well, okay. So, so I, I kind of, you know, it, it's okay, uh -huh. and I understand, <laughs> but I know this is not a pickup. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> so basically, I'm I'm willing to tolerate you. Okay. Okay. Relief. So, in that regard, you know, the Sex Pistols, you know, was an invention. Yes. Uh -huh. A brilliant invention, yes. I think. The world sees it that way. Right. I think. Um, I'm not so convinced. Okay. I think it was a good idea. And I think it had uh, a purpose. Mm -hmm. And I think um, we all worked very hard. And I say we, I don't mean it in the royal sense. Mm -hmm. I just say we because they were friends of mine. Mm -hmm. Friends of mine from art school. Um, artists. Uh, with a lot of pretension. Uh, to uh, endeavor to change the culture if we could, mm -hmm. at the dawn of the 70s. And uh, at that time, I suppose, who wanted to like David Hockney? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe you'd, you would definitely drink with Francis Bacon. Um, there was a sense that... Uh, what do you do when you're thrown out of art school mm -hmm. in this dreadful world? What do you do with this world? And uh, we decided we just simply wanted to make it worse. 
<laughs> How were we going to do that? So, um, well, most people, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but most people uh, we felt were stupid. And so we could fool enough to try to um, endeavour to make it worse. Uh, we would manipulate. Mm -hmm. We would create hell. And um, we would make trouble. That was our, our virtue. We would make trouble. We would keep warm in the winter by doing that. And uh, <laughs> um, we began uh, in a humble way. And then we became uh, encouraged by our ridiculous success. And um, in doing so, uh, I had uh, a, a sense that it might be good to, as artists, to work within the popular culture mm -hmm. and uh, work in something called pop music in the pop music mm -hmm. industry. I had not a clue what the hell that really meant. I just knew that they were awfully ugly, the people that worked in it. That was our <laughs> virtue. We knew they were ugly. <laughs> and we also had a sense that we were beautiful. So, in that regard, it, wasn't, uh, it was a question of creating a battlefield uh, in which uh, the beautiful would come to belong to us. The ugly would stay out of town. Mm -hmm. And uh, in some strange way, um, the youth, I don't think we were so youthful. We were over 25, so we were getting old. Um, but the youth really um, liked the fact that we could call everybody else ugly. And um, that included the Rolling Stones, of course, mm -hmm. one of the most ugliest. <laughs> and uh, uh, many others. And we decided we would, we, we, we would uh, draw a line. And that line was a very artistic line, uh, a line that m meant the difference between failure and success. Anybody that was successful was extremely ugly. Anybody that was a failure was extremely beautiful. We were all beautiful failures. And it was a way of, uh, of looking at failure as a noble pursuit. Mm -hmm. And I was taught one thing at art school, which was to, um, to basically look at failure as a noble pursuit because it was the only way we really felt uh, we could change the culture. It was the only way we understood um, by being fearless, by being capable, by, being, by embracing the idea of failure, that we could ever go forward in doing anything. This was a very 19th century William Blake style. Mm -hmm. uh, England was frout in those days in art schools with many uh, teachers uh, purporting the William Blake stroke William Morris, socialist principles, romantic principles. I was brought up in that world. So it was much better to be a, a brilliant, magnificent, super, sonic, flamboyant failure than any kind of benign success. <laughs> benign success, you know, you put David Hockney mm -hmm. into that bracket. Okay, <laughs> so in that regard, in that regard, we basically uh, could go forward and, and, and it was very simple and it, it was an artistic principle mm -hmm. which uh, I had blind faith in, absolutely blind faith, more so than any other friend, probably was the thing that termed me a lunatic. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, so I went forward in that idea and decided I would um, embark on uh, embracing the new generation. 
uh, how to do it. That was the key, man. <laughs> you know, many people consider me a charlatan, uh, a manipulator, a, a complete fraud, a, a criminal, um, someone whose reputation was based on turning British culture into nothing more than a cheap marketing gimmick. And I honestly have to confess here and now that most of that's absolutely true. <laughs> and, and I don't have any shame in that regard. Because mm. uh, I don't like the English. I never did. I think they're a complete nation of liars. Uh, and basically they've, they've been driven by the success of, uh, 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 of developing a culture of deception mm -hmm. for centuries. Their success per, uh, d uh, their, their basic success is wholly dependent on how well they practice that culture of deception. The point is, I was going to practice it better than they were. <laughs> so, with that architecture in mind, that way of building a, 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 a cultural battle, um, punk came about uh, with extreme hatred, Incredible aggression. Um, and Do you think it was genuine hatred or is it oh, just an uh, attitude? Well, I think hatred uh, caused by um, one's, uh, I think, personal background, mm -hmm. you know, and the way you're brought up. Uh, uh, um, I, I, uh, I, I, I felt... Uh, I don't know why I have to keep mentioning David Hockney, but I do. <laughs> I, I always remember Francis Bacon, when I first met him, said that, you know, if that man could have been run over by a bus, we'd be drinking champagne immediately. <laughs> you know. And so, uh, I, for some reason, David Hockney stays in my brain right now because he kind of epitomised everything that one hated about the English. So, um, uh, uh, I, I, I said about... Um, uh, 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 I said about sort of thinking how, how to do that and I, and I thought the first thing I can do, I came from a, uh, um, a world of corset makers, uh, uh, um, ridiculous people, my family making clothes for show business, uh, boxers, cricketers, movie stars. Um, my grandmother ran a corset company. I was drowning in serge cloth <laughs> for years, <laughs> since a baby, you know. <laughs> As the smell of gabardine used to make me want to vomit. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, I, 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 uh, I had this unquestionable uh, feeling from a very young age of hating fashion. Um, and yet I was having to embrace it after being thrown out of art school because I couldn't figure out how the fuck I was going to ever make a living. You know, you're going to follow David Hockney, might as well go to your grave, right? <laughs> so you're going to think, like, oh good. my God, what are we going to do? You go Frank Orbach, turn left. Uh, David Hockney, turn right. <laughs> if you're gay, you may be able to hang out with Franny Bacon for a while. <laughs> And that's about it in those days. And we're talking the dawn of the 70s. It wasn't a great time, you know. <laughs> so I, uh, I thought, I'll go into fashion. I always liked Elvis Presley. I, I always liked listening to pop music because it made you want to fuck. You know? There was something sexually liberating about it since the age of 13 or before, you know, there was, there, there was moments that you had an epiphany every 10 minutes when you heard a rock and roll record, there was another epiphany. You said, what the fuck is this? This is great, right? So you just, you know, and you couldn't actually articulate what was great about it, but it was something to do. You just wanted to jerk off, you wanted to do it. You had a fantasy, you, you wanted sex, you, you, you wanted to imagine sex, you, you, you anticipated fucking the girl next door, or, down the street or whatever it was. So th th there were th th those moments you preserved in some shape or form. I did at least. And so when I went into art school, all I was obsessed by was the look of those moments, the look of that mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. 
I was obsessed by the look of the music. And, um, and that kind of uh, led me to, 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 to understand the, what I can best describe as the musical end of painting. It was kind of the shit end, you know, the end that you know, down the end into somewhere in that murky pond and, <laughs> at the bottom of the of the of the uh, uh, of the road. You know, the, 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 in that end, there, there was something I liked about it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I I felt that it, it it had something that I could relate to, truthfully, and with with compassion. So I I uh, I. I, I, I thought that if I could find a way to recreate that feeling, mm -hmm. uh, then I would be on the road to doing what I was supposed to do, to become this magnificent failure, this, uh, follow this noble pursuit, create trouble, be fearless, do everything these William Morris stroke, um, William Blakeian lecturers were training me to be. I was an agent provocateur. And um, I thought the first thing I can do is um, make clothes that look wrong, right? <laughs> that was the idea. If I could make clothes that look wrong and then sell them as looking right, then I'm an alchemist up there in the realm of William Blake and <laughs> others, you know, because I've always understood that the great artists are not people that just paint. I mean, how pathetic is that? <laughs> They're people who are alchemists. Mm -hmm. They are sorcerers. They're magicians. OK, I wanted to be one of those. I thought, if I can make clothes that look wrong and sell them as clothes that look right, I'm doing just that. I'm as good as Rambo. I'm as good as Baudelaire. I'm as good as William Blake. Okay, so I uh, I said about that, and 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 the, 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 it, it took a few years actually. It wasn't a, a, an easy road at all. It was quite a struggle. I had to go through, dig up all the ruins uh, out of the culture that I liked, you know, trying to find the pearls and the rubies in an old culture that was fast disappearing, that no one cared for, because no one collected that part of the culture. That was the murky pond, as I say, the, the musical end of painting. And um, in doing so, you know, I, I slowly got to the point where if I could make a pair of trousers that looked like you couldn't walk in them, <laughs> I'd be getting somewhere, okay? So that's what I did, and I put a strap between the legs, and that was the, really the, the ultimate moment. There were other little details I won't bore you with, but basically the strap between the legs. So we're going to sell a pair of trousers that looks, for instance, as if you're all tied up with nowhere to go and you can't go anywhere, <laughs> no matter what. You're doing justice to what that world out there, that shit world, that world right out there, out there, out that window was about. And that's what I did, and it became iconic. I won't bore you again with the details of all of that because we all know the history has been written. Let, let, let me ask that a, became punk. Let, let me ask a question in this context. I mean, if, if you, I remember that very week, I was, I'm afraid, not the Sex Pistols, but the Damned, that were one of the first punk records, New Rose, I was in London, and it was like hitting uh, <laughs> even an academic. I was at that time already. What, what I found so fascinating about this period, and sorry, I, I don't want to be nostalgic, but it's part of your biography, I suppose, is that, that at the same time, obviously, you intuitively hit the right nerve with the young, as you just mentioned, but within weeks, literally, it was also high fashion. I remember that by the end of 76, I think it was already Vogue, having the first razor blade uh, decorations, accessoires, et cetera, et cetera. And by what well, you're saying- Well, they're all whores, man. They yeah, all dance to the yeah, same tune, you know. Too. But, but, but what I find fascinating, what I was also what you're already saying, is that it sounds like a concept, right? But at the same time, it's obviously a very intuitive concept. I remember by that time already that since 74, I think it was, uh, I hope it's not too much insider stuff, that you were already managing the New York Dolls in, in New York, who were some kind of a pre-punk kind of uh, group, et cetera, et cetera. So... I think that was my rites of passage. Okay. 
I think that was a way of me getting away from London uh -huh. and learning how to yeah. fuck, really. Uh -huh. New York's much better so it's, for that. It's a lot of, but, but seriously, I mean, the, you say it's a concept, but, but obviously it also was, was a very intuitive concept. How would, would you describe that? I mean, you, you didn't sit down. I mean, I don't know who, who knows the monks. There was a German, uh, English, uh, American group in the 60s, and they were at that time also hitting, not quite like punk, but some kind of predecessors to punk. And it, only a couple of weeks be, or years before it turned out, it was a concept. It was like arts people, PR people who had invented that. And what you're now saying is that punk followed similar lines. So a concept, but still a very intuitive, very street close, if that word exists, concept. Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, punk was a label that was given to that music to describe what you say. Um, uh, I just thought it sounded good. If I didn't, mm -hmm. I would never have allowed it to be called mm -hmm. that. I just thought, that's a good idea. That sounds mm -hmm. great. They thought it was derogatory. That was even better. <laughs> you uh -huh. know, so I kind of thought it sounded terrific. And, mm -hmm. and, and one embraced what people thought you would hate. That's always kind of wonderful, you mm -hmm. know, when you ever have sex, you embrace something you hate. Mm -hmm. And you can like it more than you ever would mm -hmm. ordinarily think. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it kind of, it, it felt sexy to me. And, um, and so, in the end, uh, it was, um, you use the tools that are around okay. you and, and uh -huh. the way you curate them is what ultimately leads you to, to, to make something that, 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 in my mind, was what I liked. Mm -hmm. um, the Sex Pistols, the name, I, uh, I had been fascinated, as I told you earlier, by sex, mm -hmm. uh, listening to music, huh? rock and roll. So, you know, I had lots of sex books, lots of pin-up books. Mm -hmm. I used to sell them in my store on the King's Road. It's a stupid thing to sell, but that's what I sold. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, it was called sex too. In its, yeah, uh, it's one of its incarnations. incarnations exactly, there were many. Yes, uh -huh. there were the, there, there, there was just a bridge from art school. Okay. You're thrown out of art school, you want to get into whatever. Mm -hmm. um, uh, real life, I suppose, uh -huh. in some shape or form. Yeah. Connect with it, express mm -hmm. something with it, try to change it, perhaps. Um, I used a store to do that. I actually took on an, a, a, a role. Mm -hmm. I was always a good actor. My grandmother always thought I was meant for the stage. She thought using crayons and drawing, making drawings was the most stupid activity. <laughs> she said, you know, she was, wanted me to tread the boards, as mm -hmm. they say. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I didn't do that. But uh, when it came to actually being on the King's Road, it was brilliant to mm -hmm. actually sort of play a role. And uh, many incarnations happened, and the, the, the one that really kicked off was the one called Sex. Because you have to understand, Anything to do with sex makes the English go mad. <laughs> you have to understand that. You know, it makes them go wild. Okay, so how is you know, that? By the way, what, it's what's your, I mean, it's very difficult to, dis to to understand it. Yeah. I don't even understand it myself, uh -huh. but I can assure you, it makes them go love, mad. Love. So, <laughs> but but give us another interpretation. Maybe the ultimate interpretation. Why is that? Why is it? I don't it, know. If you look well, you look at it. Tony Blair, you know. <laughs> and just think about him. You know, he's preaching in uh, from the pulpit at the House of the Parliament, and he goes home, puts on his carpet slippers, he play, prays to God, and then he listens to the clash. Uh -huh. How do you figure this guy out? It's a difficult <laughs> question, yeah. huh? Does he have any sex in between? I don't think so. <laughs> you mean between... It's, yeah, he's a difficult guy. You look at him, you can't uh -huh. think there's anything about the man that's very sexy. You know, it's a difficult thing. You look uh -huh. at Margaret Thatcher, you can't think about anything. <laughs> it's very sexy, you know. Yeah, no, true. It's a very... The very English are very specific. difficult to understand yeah, yeah. in that uh -huh. regard. Uh -huh. uh, they don't come easy when it comes to sex, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. So men and women are separate from a very, very early age. Uh -huh. You don't ever want to go out with an English girl, I reckon. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> so the, 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 the point of the matter is that, you, that, that it's very, very difficult to understand that culture. But if you use the word sex, you're going to kick it off. 
<laughs> you're going to start something yeah. going. Uh -huh. And so, I, you know, I was thinking, yeah, well, you know, they live in windmills and meanwhile, they make rubber masks. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So I would track these lunatics down across the English countryside who made rubber masks in windmills and sell them on the King's Road in Chelsea and sell them to members of parliament for funny games at the weekend, right? In windmills, I suppose, right? I don't know, wherever they went. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But, and I can tell you that uh, I did a roaring trade. So you have to understand that, you know, this is a, the life of the English. So here you are selling rubber knickers, rubber marks, maybe a gag or two, a whip, a chain, a nipple clamp. I don't know, to sort of rather robust middle-aged parliamentarians walking in and complaining about the price of such things. <laughs> saying, I only want it for a weekend. <laughs> Uh, accusing me of being yeah. some sort of filthy merchant, <laughs> selling these, uh -huh. these, these, uh, th these contractions what, what, and gadgets what, 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 for what, ex what he thought was extortionate amounts yeah. of money. <laughs> it's the most extraordinary life I led yeah. at that time. Yeah. And it was a natural thing that the very, very young, the new generation, were following quite close behind these mm -hmm. awful people. Huh? The sort of thatch right type people. And, and, the, uh, and behind them, there, there, was, there was this young generation that they were coming in and they were thinking, these rubber masks are rather fun. <laughs> what, do, what do we do in them? I couldn't tell them they can go to the disco or anything like uh -huh. that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, they, they, they liked the more um, simple clothes, uh, the, just a rubber T-shirt. Mm -hmm. Of course, you'd sweat like hell. And I would tell them you'd have to constantly douse your body and, uh -huh talcum powder and so on and so forth. And, and obviously if they were very fat, I thought it'd be good because they could lose weight. And so I felt I was being charitable and, and, and quite kind. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and actually in the end, I thought that, um, uh, that this was a good idea, this fetishistic clothing. Because mm -hmm. somehow or another, I thought the 14 year olds uh, in England, I don't know about your country, but in England, um, you know, this is where people experiment with their sexuality, okay? And um, rubber may be the way to go. Uh, I also <laughs> sold leather too. And, uh, and, 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 and these two properties, these uh -huh. two fabrics, were really the, 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 the basis and the root of those uh, clothes that ultimately the young generation sought out because they were different from mm -hmm. anything anybody else was wearing. So if you stormed out of my shop on a Saturday morning wearing a rubber t-shirt and leather jeans and, um, uh, and, and got to the other end of the King's Road without being arrested, <laughs> you were doing, pre you were doing uh -huh. pretty well. Yeah. And, 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 and some people were finally arrested and I would get raided constantly by the police. Really? And I was uh, certainly fined many times in front of these mm -hmm. English judges who mm -hmm. would say, you know, you're causing a breach of the peace if we catch you here again and uh, you'll be sent to one of Her Majesty's prisons where you'll serve no, long, no lesser time than three months imprisonment and that's Quite it and get out of here uh -huh. and uh, find 200 pounds bomb, you know. Uh -huh. And of course, you'd go back and you'd just make a zillion more rubber <laughs> knickers. You wouldn't give a damn. Uh -huh. So that actually was all my early training in, the, mm -hmm. in, in, in yeah. what became known as the punk rock culture. Parenthesis here, uh, because uh, you're, you're talking about uh, the English in particular. And uh, yesterday we had this discussion, is it Markham or Malcolm? And you said it's Malcolm because it's Scottish, but we, uh, all of those who didn't read it yet should realize that, that you, in fact, are very, very cosmopolitan uh, genes. Uh, it's Portuguese. I think your mother's Portuguese. Yeah, Spanish-Portuguese. Uh, my father's your Scottish. father's Scottish. You lived in 
or your father lived in Cuba. I don't know. Was where born in Cuba. Born, was born in Cuba, etc. So uh, there is there seems to be uh, some Britishness, nevertheless, in you, but also some some other kinds of, of cultural impacts. But what I'd like to, to, to come back to, actually, and you mentioned this, and I suppose, so sorry for the sex pistol thing, I thought the thing about sex actually is very interesting, and could imagine that one or two of well, you Well, the idea, even, just the it. name, the exactly. name sex pistols yeah. was made up of, I just wanted them to look like young, uh -huh. sexy assassins. The pistol, <laughs> you know, a pistol is usually a small gun, right? So it's like uh -huh. the idea, they were 18. <laughs> they have that size of penis. It was a small, small, it's about there, okay. about there, right? Okay. Okay, so it's like, how, you know, how do you create a, a pop group and give them sub, some cultural subversive feeling? You know, so I thought, yeah, uh -huh. the sex pistols are young, sexy assassins. Uh -huh. Guys with small dicks, but they're going to kill you, regardless. <laughs> right? I, I, I must admit, you know, that since uh, until this very day, and indeed I was an early fan of the Sex Pistols, at, at roughly the same time I was quite frequently in Amsterdam. And you know what? What I thought the Sex Pistols came from, seriously, in Amsterdam shops they sold some kind of a gimmick. It was like a metal thing, and it had, how do you call it, like a handle of a gun. Oh, wow. And then you would, 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 would create some kind of a movement. Here is this guy with what you just called, it's the dick, I suppose. Is that a correct term, Gary? Yeah, penis. Still, yeah, okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know who you invited? He had thought. I mean, invite, invite a German professor and he, don't know, he doesn't know about these terms. And then there was some funny movement. So you, 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 you live a different. You, there, was, there was a gimmick exactly at that very time. Was sort of oh, wow. Well, well, I'm not familiar with that, but anyway. Oh, it, was fun. it was fun, you know? I mean, the, the, the bad news, it was just for looking at, which actually brings us to, to another major topic, and you just mentioned that, and so let's just uh, skip roughly 40 years in between, yeah. and, and actually uh, assuming, of course, that those 40 years you were more or less all the time seriously working on concepts and what you just called... I don't know nobody will mention it yet, but the look of music, because I think this is what it's now at the core of what, what uh, Scheidlerus is presenting and Bernd at the gallery, and what I, by tracing once more your work, was with you all the time, as far as I can tell. It was there with punk, it was music, it was there it for was most images, people, it was actually. Look, and it is probably for most people, exactly. I think so. Back in the day, when, when pop culture was such an important part of you creating an identity for yourself, you know? You know, one's always, you know, from the age of 13, you're always in search of an identity. And, and what was easy was to attach yourself to some pop uh -huh. culture. You know, I always remember, you know, as a kid, if you carried an album, because they were quite big albums, mm -hmm. so they were wonderful things, so you carried it under your arm and you went on the tube or, or what you called the metro in mm -hmm. France or what you, whatever, um, subway in New York. You, you got on the, the, the tube and you, you carried that album under your arm. People knew who you were. Mm -hmm. There was a code. Mm -hmm. So it kind of created a, a, a sort of tribe, you know, the, the tribe, it became, it was, and it was, very sec it, it was a great way to seduce mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had a, a record under your <laughs> arm and you had this guy, I don't know, maybe it's Elvis Presley, maybe it's the Rolling Stones, people would kind of look at you, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you were the Rolling Stones, you might get the best looking girl on the tube train. <laughs> right? You're sort of looking at you because you're feeling cool, you got the kind of Rolling Stones on your arm. So, I, the, the look, if you, even if you looked like you were crap, you know, <laughs> if you had the Rolling Stones mm -hmm. on you, you had a chance, right? So it's like uh, the, the, the look was become so, mm -hmm. it, it was so endemic to the way you thought and the way you, th and, 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 and what you dealt with. So I, I, I was completely obsessed, you know, when I was a kid and, and when I went to art school about this look. And... Um, when I, I used to hang out with Francis Bacon uh, when I was much older, uh, uh, just a little bit after the Sex Pistols. And it was very interesting because he was very much about the look of things. Mm -hmm. He was a really quite a, uh, I wouldn't call him a dandy. That was a bit of the wrong word. But he was very interested in the look of things. And Francis would say to me, he said, you know, we'd go and see a, a, a show by Edouard Manet or something. 
and you say, Malcolm, you know, what do you think of this? And you say, well, I don't know, Francis, he's a great painter. Great painter? <sighs> no, 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 this man is not a great painter, Malcolm. This man is a magician. I said, magician? I said, he's a magician. I said, I don't fucking know how he does that. How did he paint that? You know, he said, the man is a magician. He's a sorcerer. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a way, it took me a little while to really understand what he meant. But I realized, uh, in the end, uh, that's what actually differentiates uh, one artist mm -hmm. from another. Uh, you know, there are artists, thousands, millions maybe, I don't know. Uh, but there are not many alchemists. Mm -hmm. There are not many sorcerers. And there are very few magicians. And it's those that really actually change the culture, because those mm -hmm. hold up a mirror. Mm -hmm. Hey, you, you, you take two pots, you move it to the side, the left, the right, whatever way. And it's, yeah, you think this is just a couple of pots. But the way this guy's put these pots together makes, them make, makes those pots look slightly different to what you ever imagined before. It changes the way you look at the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, that takes alchemy. That takes alchemy because in the end, they're just a couple of old pots. How does he do that? That's a trick. A massive, massive, major trick. Franny understood that mm -hmm. and understood that that was the key <coughs> and core element in honestly most great works of art. I think we live in a world today which is summed up culturally with two words. One is authenticity and the other is karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> to actually uh, make sense of that, for an artist, you have to say, well, most artists spend their entire lives today trying to make authentic or trying to authenticate mm -hmm. what is karaoke. But let me tell you, you can't do that <laughs> if you're mm -hmm. just an artist. Mm -hmm. You've got to be an alchemist. Mm -hmm. You've got to be a magician to do that. And there are very few on this planet that can do I'll that. Call them. Tell them. Pardon? The alchemists, who for you are contemporary alchemists. I don't know whether I would want to announce that okay. right now. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh -huh. But, you know, I'm just saying to you, that's, uh, that, that's how I think uh, about the world we live in today. And I don't know if I could have articulated the same 30 years ago, because I think 30 years ago or more was a different world. Uh, you know, the, 30 years ago, the world was much more naive. Uh, you know, the, 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 there has been a, an extraordinary commodification of the culture mm -hmm. over the past 30 or more years. When punk came about, it came about through innocence, to be honest, through real innocence and through a genuine, true compassion. Um, you could make trouble and you could destroy the culture. And we really did, for a moment, destroy the culture and status quo in the UK. There is no ifs or buts. We will go down in history for having done that. Um, and we changed it, irrevocably, for a moment. We changed it, and it, and, and it, and it, it had an a, a incredible effect. And it's still used today as a measurement, mm -hmm. it's like a measuring stick. If you have to have a stick that measures what is cool, you know, and you're sitting there as some ridiculous chairman of a bank, okay, the gangsters of the world. All right, so you're sitting there and, 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 and you're deciding, I, 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 gotta tr I, I gotta figure out how to be cool. Huh? Well, here's this idiot in a suit in a bank and he's trying to figure that out. How does he figure that out? He has to go to the thing that he's been denigrating for centuries that today is labeled punk. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, if I can get this bank to look a little bit more punk, 
<laughs> maybe I can be cool. <laughs> maybe I can get invited to the right parties. Maybe I can do this. Maybe I can do that. So suddenly it's a measurement of what mm -hmm. is cool. No? Uh, it doesn't truthfully work anymore. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we've come to realise. And so this culture yeah. today is... Uh, it's under it's under serious uh, it's it's under the microscope uh -huh. because uh, there is a sense right now we want to be real real to be real is to be very brave you know because you, to be real to be to, to be true to to be physical to to really have something you can really grab now is what's essential, mm -hmm. central for the survival uh, of the planet uh, and, and essential for the, for the, for the natural mm -hmm. and, 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 and growth of the culture, generally mm -hmm. speaking. I, I think that, um, I think we're in a massive transitionary yeah. stage. Let, let me ask a question because uh, you, you just said the bankers, just as, uh, let's say, a parse per total, I don't know whether that word exists in the United States or in, in England, but uh, that, that, that they have to go back to punk to feel there is, there's this kind of revolution. I mean, you, you mentioned authenticity. That, to a certain extent, has become a cliché itself. Would you think yeah, that, that to an extent. Talk, talking about music, about, 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 about <coughs> art, about the magicians, the alchemists, do you think that uh, with this intuitively felt there's a transition, there must be a change, maybe a revolution, but in any case, a major change like punk uh, in culture. Do you think it could still be music? Could it still be some kind of popular culture to create something similar like that? I suppose, I don't subscribe to prognosis, so it's probably very difficult, but could you think something similar could happen again, coming from music? coming from paintings? I don't think it's about it music different? or painting. I think, I think it's about the word slow. Uh -huh. I think fast isn't happening. Mm -hmm. If you take a spin painting by Damien Hirst, you can spin around the fucking world. You know, just spin, 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 you know, shh. It's not happening. It's going nowhere. Mm -hmm. Fast art is going nowhere mm -hmm. fast, okay? I think slow is more interesting. Mm -hmm. Slow art is where we're going right now. It's funny, isn't it, really, when you think about that? It's like a slow dance. Mm -hmm. It's a slow thing. You know, slow you means you can focus on things more. You see the nuances, the details, the preamble to sex rather than the act itself. Mm -hmm. It's more interesting. Mm -hmm. We've missed a lot of the details and a lot of the ideals that go hand in hand with those details. Slow is the word for the next yeah. decade, there's no question. Uh, there, there's an announcement here because we need to address also the videos and the art you're doing at this very moment. They're very and, and slow. And, sorry? <laughs> They're very slow. They're very slow. They, they was just wanted to say that uh, you, 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 you watch them and you're not necessarily surprised, but uh, they're exactly fascinating by the slowness. Uh, mm. It's amazing. Mm. There's still this music. It's very, I, I heard in one of the videos, it was, I think it's some sampling of the zombies, the, the 60s group. Is that correct? Or some, some interpretation? In, 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 I, 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 I just, you know, <laughs> I've, always, I've always believed in trash culture. Mm -hmm. I've always thought there's some asset there. I always liked the debris. I was like digging in the debris. I was like finding, digging in the ruins of things that are not worth anything, supposedly. I always find something interesting. I, 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 um, I like to muck mm -hmm. in and uh, dig in. And I, 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 simply, um, I simply was concerned with um, finding a, a way to create... Um, what I thought was the musical end of painting. I hate that work that I did to be called videos. I can't stand the word video. Mm -hmm. 
It reminds me of MTV, one of the most ugliest innovations and inventions of all time. <laughs> the most dreadful people that run it and the most dreadful things that are screened on it. Uh, no, they're not videos and they're not movies. They were just a way of making paintings, except I, you know, I wasn't going to pick up a fucking brush and start to sort of swamp about on a canvas. <laughs> you know, I just thought, hey, there's all this crap out there. I can dig in to all this huge gamut of stuff made by amateurs um, before, before there was such a thing called porno stars. Uh, bef that, that, that was a, that's a 70s invention. Before then, just students, people made sex films. And they just did for mm -hmm. money, for fun, for whatever. There's an extraordinary body language because you... You, you, you did it back in those days. And I remember as a student in the 60s with an 8 millimeter camera, just by a one kilowatt bar fire with a bunch of other guys in a squat. And the only way you kept warm was watch these sex films on 8 millimeter <laughs> on, on the wall of your goddamn apartment, right? Well, I remember those moments, and those moments were sort of interesting for me. And, and, and it was always a long preamble. And then there was what they call in America the money shot which is the guy coming or whatever at the end, and then that's it, and it's kind of boring, right? So, but it was, it was I, I just like the beginning. I like this guy that would be hoovering the same piece of carpet incessantly, you know, for a minute or two, and, and it was the shaft of the hoover, and it was the movement, and it was what was in his mind, and he looked some kind of dreadful human being, and, <laughs> and you think he's waiting for... This thing that was going to come, this thing that would take him to another place, this, this sexual idea. Uh -huh. He was waiting for the knock on the door, and meanwhile he was hoovering, preparing. <laughs> and, as, and as banal as that appears, I just like the power of that. I just thought, that's great, that's a painting, that's as good as what Franny Bacon said to me when I went to the Hog and saw the exhibition of Edouard Manet. Can I be an alchemist and turn that into something magical and powerful? Can I transcend it? Can I make that make sense? So I thought, yeah, this guy with a hoover. <laughs> I'm going to turn him into this magnificent creature. And uh, I will loop this man with the hoover and I would create this and I keep him hoovering this same tiny piece of carpet for three minutes. <laughs> and I would uh, then uh, throw on a musical accompaniment to his very action. Huh? Not in sync. Who wants to ever be in sync? No, to be disconnected was much, is, is much more powerful, actually. Uh, and so um, uh, doing that uh, taught me and, uh, and made me uh, feel that I could, um, I could express something that apparently on the surface appears shallow, but underneath it lies yeah. something much deeper. The body language of people, to me, uh, has been somewhat lost, and and I think in great paintings, as I, I, you know, I tell you, standing behind Francis Bacon, looking at Franz Hals, or looking at uh, Edouard Manet, or looking at Velasco, and I, I went to many exhibits with Francis, and and uh, he taught me to look at pictures and look at body language and look at eyes and look at gestures and just you know and and talk because he loved to drink. And, 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 and I understood the, 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 the fact that body language was so important. I didn't think about it mm -hmm. before. And it came back to me only about a year ago, some of those meet, early meetings I had with him at the, uh, in the 80s. Um, uh, bore great, uh, you know, I, I started to have another mm. impact, a, a real impact on mm. me. I didn't think about and I, I thought about them and I think it was Francis Bacon in mm -hmm. my brain, actually. Uh, definitely not Fran no, David Hockney. But, <laughs> and and, and, and uh -huh. made me edit, uh -huh. in a way, those pictures to create that, that, that human torment, the anticipation, mm -hmm. that, that, that um, rejection, uh, 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 um, 
wishing, uh, hoping, uh, maybe, could be, but ultimately no way, uh, that preamble. So I thought, fuck, if I can create 21 preambles about sex without seeing any sex, if I can sustain that mm -hmm. over a, such a period of time, in a form of paintings where I could slow those movements down so they became like... And the corruptness of those early movies was such because no one who cared about preserving these movies. Absolutely. I mean, they, they, they were, they, they're, they're just crumbling ruins, uh -huh. basically. Uh -huh. But the crumbling ruin nature actually made them more painterly. And as you slowed them down, they made them even more painterly. Yeah. And uh, one girl walking down a staircase you know, actually, she's just about to enter an orgy, but you don't, you, she, you're just seeing her walking down the staircase. <laughs> and when I first saw her walking down the staircase, I thought, wow, she's, she's, fan she's fabulous. She, she's really naked and she looks great walking down the staircase. And as I kept slowing it down, I thought, wow, she's not naked. She's got, she's got exactly. stockings on and she's got knickers on. I thought, how come I made a... And, I, and, and so I took this same sequence mm -hmm. of walking down the staircase and I just kept slowing it down and slowing it down and slowing it down and slowing it down until I was almost, she, she wasn't moving hardly. She, she was just so slow taking that, that staircase. It just made you just feel so sexy because you just wanted to get down that goddamn staircase. <laughs> and, and, and I just loved it, the architecture, everything about it. And I, and I thought, what the fuck, what kind of music am I going to put to that? I don't know if any music I can put to that. And uh, I, I went out and I, I, um, at that time I, I thought the only way to treat music was for me to say, hey, if it's all about sex at the end of the day, um, why don't you just take the whole goddamn super nuts, the entire history of pop culture. Why don't you just cut it up any way, which way? we well, make no sense of it. Hey, listen, one verse and one chorus from two different songs is not going to make any difference. The narrative is not going to be any more explicit, okay? So just throw it all together. Choose it as you wish. Be in a supermarket. It's pick and mix, right? So I thought, hey, just do that. Put it all together in that way. Uh, have the the, the whole grab bag. Everybody should own it anyway. It's supposedly your culture. It's what you've been brought up to embrace. So I thought this was the one opportunity. These young contemporary artists who gave me this opportunity to contribute to their show a year ago in, in New York to this day, uh, do it. And then Malcolm, the word, to, the word we want you to exploit is the word shallow. Mm -hmm. And the guy was a Mexican, and he was, the way he said it, he said, shallow. <laughs> and he said, it made me feel that shallow was just so, ooh, it's so deep. You know? <laughs> what do I do <laughs> which, with this word, shallow? <laughs> which, which is a good moment, because uh, this, this, whatever we call it, uh, films, videos, Definitely should be seen, and you subscribe to you. Well, I call them as no, like no, musical paintings, because no, 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 that's really, really perfect, what they are. Exactly. But at that moment, uh, and there was the dramaturgy was more or less having the same. Uh, the dramaturgist, the other alchemist over there, had the same impression I had that at that stage we should introduce what has to be done all the time: create an interactive discussion. So uh, it's. It was not definitely not an academic discussion, I suppose, or monologue or dialogue, whatever, but it was a very, definitely a very serious one. And uh, so let's just open the stage and ask whether there are questions about sex, <laughs> the Sex Pistols, Mac McLaren, or indeed the look of music. Well, look at music, the sound of fashion. They came as a kind of a bouncing back and forth. Whatever. That's the world I've dwelt in. Exactly. Um, but let's let's ask these guys. Maybe they have a good. They sure. got a question. Who? Where? Who dares? <laughs> who dares to have a question? Go first. Yeah. Slashing with. Oh yeah. For, for the, this, this is all recorded by by what agency? Uh, <laughs> what? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the National Public Radio, <laughs> very suspect, very suspect. Does that make me sound any better? Yeah. <laughs> Fine. The, you, you sounded very good already, but this is even better. Mick Jagger. Did, did, you, did you or your shop or whatever, did you advocate the, um, I don't know what you, what you call that, you know, punk also went along with self-destruction 
sort of slashing, you know, bleeding and was that part well, of the fashion or did that come from somewhere else? No, I, 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 I think it came with the idea of destroying fashion. You know, if I could, how do I make clothes look wrong? You know, so making clothes look wrong was turning them inside out, upside down, cutting them up, making holes in them, turning them into rags and then trying to sell them. As it, it's like selling an oil cloth that had been in a garage and every car had been wiped with it. And then you, you, you throw it up on a rack and you cut a couple of holes in it and you put it up for sale. But bleeding was not part of it. I mean, bodily, actually, you know, actual bleeding. Because I, I remember, I don't know, I was not a fan, Some but on stage, you know, like, like, like Iggy Pop did, but, but that, yeah, okay, but that was... Some people may have bled a bit. Uh. I didn't notice. <laughs> I, I mean... You, you impressed me by knowing the monks. You should put the next question, actually. Maybe not. Oh, yes, you do. You, come on. <laughs> Forced interaction. Please hand the microphone to the lady over there. <laughs> Whatever the question may be, there's no wrong question. Maybe not a wrong question, but um, uh, what do you think for the future? Uh, is uh, sex over? What? No, I, 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 think, I, I think that... I think we've, we've had so much information, no? we, we, we've lived in a world for probably the past 20 years of such a lot of information, but the information is to, to a greater or lesser, to a greater extent, kind of vacuous, mm -hmm. because there's never been any preamble to it, so it's just mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. it's just like the end of ideas, yeah. it's not like the beginning of ideas, you don't know how ideas are born or grown, mm -hmm. you don't see the preamble to anything. You know, it's like, um, you know, just eye candy, I suppose, is one way to describe it. Uh, uh, we're now becoming more interested again in ideals, in nuances, in ideas mm -hmm. that lead up to other ideas, in the way things are described. Uh, I'm definitely interested in that mm -hmm. and have been for a while now because I think that... Um, you know, to be subversive, if you like, um, culturally speaking. It's about uh, looking at what leads up to an idea mm -hmm. rather than the idea mm -hmm. itself. Uh, I think that goes hand in hand with slowness. Slow food, slow art, slow life. Um, people should work a lot less. I think um, we should read a lot more. I think, the, 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 I think there is not an interest anymore in having five jobs. This has been foolhardy for 20 years. You know, one job is enough. You want to then go to the cinema, go to sleep, have sex, talk to your friends, do stuff. What do you want to be doing all these jobs for? <laughs> They're all the same. So one is enough, you know what I mean? So I think there's a kind of movement towards doing less and living with less than mm. more. And in terms of that, probably leading a richer life again. I think we're, we're sort of changing the way we look at things, what we value in the culture. Um, uh, the, 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 fast, uh, the fast things are... I think the word maverick is so fucking overrated. It's beyond. <laughs> if you think Sarah Palin is a maverick, God help us all. Huh? Here's another question or a remark. Yeah, this is double question. Double for, question. Yeah, for Mr. Gorbel and also for Malcolm. And that is, um, how would you describe culture today? And Malcolm, you were, you know, known for subversing culture, so. <laughs> You've said that you think that subversing culture now would be moving slower. Mm. Would you, would you yeah. say that the yeah. uh, subversiveness to the culture nowadays would be, like how would you describe yeah. our culture today being media, media psychologists? Actually, uh, I, I must admit, I mean, uh, apart from, from all the, maybe the, 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 the funny or humorous, rather humorous remarks, I think there's a lot of seriousness to exactly what, what Malcolm was just saying. And what I would 100% percent subscribe is not trying yet another definition of culture but I think that culture as a whole is such some kind of a common sense that the appearance of things I hesitate to say surface but the appearance of things 
information for information's sake or la pour la, whatever. And a lot of contemporary art is exactly about this, is about the appearance of thing. And that we, we, we thought, well, there must be something behind that, and it's not there. Yeah. And that's what I, I regard seriously about this discussion. Also very, very fascinating. That for me would be culture. Probably not anymore in terms of popular culture or high culture. I think Malcolm exactly is an, uh, the epitome of, of having merge the two concepts in, in the end, but in the end they don't say anything anymore. But I think culture of the future would be indeed going back to substance of things, trying to avoid the cliches because authenticity, you just mentioned that, I personally think it's just another cliche, mm. but so are appearance of things and surface of things, whatever, but what's behind it? And that I regard also to come back to our alchemist, a very serious one, by the way, and I have a serious magician, I regard as the real stimulating stuff, whether you call it slowness, slowness, or just trying to find the roots of things. How do things develop? And to pick up the sex one, I would completely agree. Yeah. Maybe it has to do with our age. The foreplay is, can take for hours, not because we can't do anything <laughs> different, but it's fun. And that's where the joy starts. And maybe that's one of the answers. And sex and culture obviously have a lot to do. Thanks for the question. You were very nice to put the question to me. But then it's Malcolm again. I also think, well, I also think it's about the mistakes in culture. You know, I was brought up and lectured to on painters like Bonnard. And it was always about, it's the mistakes. It's the mistakes in his work is what makes his work so great. And it was always the mistakes. And I remember this, this, this lecture saying, it's the mistakes. It's the mistakes. That's what makes him great. It's the mistakes in his work. And you thought, wow, you know, you make mistakes. How do you keep making mistakes? You work on making mistakes. <laughs> And I thought, wow, that's the idea. You've got to make mistakes. <laughs> so I said, it's like anti-success. It's anti-perfection. It's against perfection. And how do you do that consciously? Or how do you, do, how do you make that work? And uh, I think punk was definitely about mistakes. Uh, it was about making cash from chaos. Uh, so I, I, I think that um, in, in, in contemporary art, um, there's so much perfection. It's so slick, it's so produced and fabricated that the mistakes are not there. And I kind of, you know, it sounds stupid in some way. It's just like a smudge or, you know, a, 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 a movement this way or that way. Is it about the happy accident? I don't know. I, ju I just think mistakes are rather good. Mm -hmm. I like them because they're more human. I, uh, I'm one big hell of a mistake. But there's no naivety anymore in society, so you can't make mistakes well, anymore without... Well, I think you're it. right. The naivety has been driven out of society. Hey, I went to Broadway and saw Tom Stoppard's Rock and Roll. I've never been a huge fan of Tom Stoppard. I have actually come up against him and had many running battles. Uh, we both worked for Steven Spielberg for a number of years, and he was my boss, and he was an asshole. However, I liked his reviews, and I went to see the show uh, without any preconception. And I thought, wow, this is really great, this play. I don't understand how any Americans even understand it. He's talking about Prague in 1968. I don't know. He's looking around all these Americans. They're all pretending they understand. Even it's hard for me, you know. And I'm European, OK? So I thought what was interesting about it was it was about ideals. It was about having ideals. And I thought, ideals? That's something that seems to have disappeared. We're living in 2007 or 8. I think it was 2007 or 8. I saw it. I thought, ideals? What the fuck are ideals? 
and it had disappeared. They had gone out the window ages, eons, decades ago. I thought it was so brilliant, this play. It's about something I'd forgotten all about. I, re I, I went back to these moments that when one had ideals in, in art school, in living as I did back in the, in the, in the 60s and early 70s. And I thought, wow, that's incredible. Uh, is that naive? I don't think so. I think it's just a question of people sort of learning to 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 to, to cut uh, cut up um, to to basically um, see how we've changed from a culture of necessity into a culture of desire. How once upon a time we lived on the, basis we, on the basis that we consumed what we needed in order to survive and then decided to consume what we needed in order not to survive. Huh? So you, 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 the, the, there was a changeover. It happened somewhere at the end of the 50s into the 60s and we're still in it. And now we're fed up with this culture of desire. It's dreadful, it's boring, it doesn't really reveal too much. And you lose all this sense of, uh, uh, of aspiration to something, of the development of something, of wanting to have something because you've struggled to get it and it's really meaningful to you and, and, and has, in, in, in essence, a, a, a sense that you need and, uh, and, and feel that it can be useful to you. Uh, people today purchase things that are not really truthfully of any use to them whatsoever. Uh, so naivety, I don't know whether naivety is a word that really can truthfully uh, describe that change in society that we've lived under for the last 50 years. I think um, it's, uh, it's fraudulent. There's a lot of uh, problems in the culture that really has made us go down different roads and, the, and, and there's a lot of distortion of the truth. Yeah. But, but what, if, if I may not, not give an answer to this definition of culture, but also again picking up on what you both were saying, I think in the end we were extremely naive by non-naivete, the assumption that we can control things, like whether it's complex systems or technology or social structures whatsoever, and what we know, experience, whether it's the, 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 the financial markets or technology whatsoever. I think from day to day, if we've opened eyes, and that's what I like about, about, about Mark, Mark, Malcolm, Malcolm's, Malcolm's work, is that, that is, at, at one stage it's alchemist, but on the other hand, it's the child's eyes and, and, and just looking through things and not being satisfied with, 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 with the surface. Uh, and so I suppose we are in the end very naive and even more so by believing we are not because the belief in we can control things and it turns out day to day, on a day to day basis that we don't control things and yet we survive and that's already something. More questions? The monk's question, you, you see what you created? No, no, not one, once more, but I'm so impressed you know the monks, amazing. You're German or American or none of those two? I'm Berliner. Berliner, okay, oh, so you should know. Okay, who else has a question? Uh, uh, Gary's uh, doing this quite slightly slow but impatient <laughs> things. So that, 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 that may be, and I, I don't think there is a, is a final word or something. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we got a lot of information. Uh, we were made curious, maybe not a lot of answers, final answers, but there are no answers. But I think I'm no more curious at least, and hope some of you too, about the, the art you're doing, the look of music, uh, the, the, the things you described. I hesitate to call them videos, as you see. Yeah. It's an attempt Painting. at returning to painting. It's an attempt at... Sorry? What does the gallerist say? No, no, no. no. I mean, there's... Yeah, I know. Yeah, but, but I mean, you know, at least people should have something to play these things on. So though that's the technical term. Okay. Yeah. Shame on me anyway, but you know, that's, that's, that's nearly true any day. So no but a final word probably from whatever you want to say as... 
the magician, alchemist, uh, <laughs> child, naive. I wish. Naive. I wish. I don't know if I Give am. Give these guys okay. something to go to bed with. The monk, the monk lady. Yes, um, I think, uh, Mr. McLaren, you uh, know the time of the Studio 54 in New York. You have been there, I, I'm quite sure. I, I, I've been there once, yes. Yeah. And you, you, you got in, or? Yeah. <laughs> One. Are you? You have been bored. Uh, bored about? No, you couldn't ever be bored. You had yeah. to watch your ass. <laughs> <laughs> so much about sex. <laughs> well. No, but just the question about um, the ener energy. Something about energy. Something about energy? Energy, yeah. In the Studio 54, it was very energetic. No, I mean, in general. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I'm sorry. No, I remember, <laughs> I remember the time there, and I remember oh, yeah. that it was a very special energy. And it no was question a... about that. <laughs> 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 no, and I, 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 if I remember the time, I mean, in general, the time. In yeah. The, what was it? What, what was it? In the 70s. In, yeah. Late 70s. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a very special swing in that time. No, no question over. about Not that. Not only in New York. <laughs> in well, I spread around a bit, you know. <laughs> and people picked up on it. Yeah. 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 New York was probably its. It was the center of that kind of fest. Yeah. Uh, it was. Uh, it was very hardcore, you know. And yeah. uh, you really did have to watch your ass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not joking, actually. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the nice thing about the nice. <laughs> what? I'm sorry, but it's the truth. <laughs> oh, you, you need you need some microphone. Is is that a question or a final statement, Gary? I just want to say, if there are other questions like this, that. <laughs> uh, we all invite you to an informal reception in the next room to engage Malcolm in a conversation in a smaller and more intimate uh, group. Okay. And thank you very much. Thank Pleasure. You for bringing Malcolm. Thank you for coming here. Pleasure. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> and I just... I just realized that this will never be broadcast for a couple of for a couple of reasons. <laughs>